On April 14, 1865, Abraham Lincoln was shot while attending a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Lincoln died the following morning, becoming the first U.S. president to be assassinated. James Garfield became the second victim of assassination when he died on September 19, 1881 of blood poisoning from a gunshot wound he sustained in a Washington Depot three and a half months earlier. During a reception at the Pan American Exposition on September 6, 1901, William McKinley was shot. He died eight days later. On November 22, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the fourth U.S. president to be assassinated. In 1964, the government concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole assassin. In 1964, the government was wrong. On Thursday, November 21, 1963, the Texas School Book Depository, the Picket Fence, the Triple Underpass, and the Grassy Knoll were merely parts of a small, intimate area called Dealey Plaza, still unknown to the world outside of Dallas. That evening, an unknown employee of the Texas School Book Depository, Lee Harvey Oswald, made arrangements with a fellow employee for a ride to Irving following work. Oswald was separated from his wife and living in this rooming house in Oak Cliff, a Dallas suburb. His wife, Marina, and their two daughters were staying with Ruth Payne at her home in Irving. Lee told his co-worker, Buell Wesley Frazier, that he needed to go to Irving that evening to pick up some curtain rods for his Oak Cliff rooming house. That night, Lee and Marina Oswald stayed at the Payne home in Irving. President Kennedy and his wife, Jackie, stayed at the Texas Hotel in Fort Worth. On the morning of November 22nd, Lee Oswald rode into Dallas with Buell Frazier. President Kennedy arrived at Dallas Love Field aboard Air Force One at 11.40 a.m. Dallas time. Coke Buchanan, Director of Communications at the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, was at Love Field when President Kennedy arrived. On November 22nd, 1963, I was standing in a crowd at Love Field with other people watching the President of the United States and his wife walk over the fence to shake hands. I was fortunate enough to come within a few feet of him that day. Approximately 10 minutes after the arrival of Air Force One at Love Field, the motorcade began making its way toward downtown Dallas and history. Secret Service Agent William Greer was driving the limousine with Agent Roy Kellerman sitting beside him in the front seat. Behind them, in fold-down jump seats, sat Nellie Connolly and her husband, Texas Governor John Connolly. In the rear seat was Jackie Kennedy and the President. Leaving Love Field, the motorcade made its way on Mockingbird Lane to Lemon Avenue, 
Followed by the Secret Service follow-up car, the presidential limousine proceeded on Lemon Avenue to Turtle Creek Boulevard and Cedar Springs Avenue. From Cedar Springs, the motorcade entered downtown Dallas on Harwood. A few blocks west of this point, the JFK Assassination Information Center is located on the third floor of the West End Marketplace. Open to the public seven days a week, the center maintains a display section covering the major events and new developments concerning the assassination. The center also gathers information on all aspects of the murder of John F. Kennedy, which it makes available to researchers. In addition, the center is involved in several special events each year. In October of 1992, the National Historical Mint visited the center to display the gun used by Jack Ruby to kill Lee Harvey Oswald. Center guests and collectors were offered the chance to purchase one of the limited edition of bullets fired from Ruby's revolver. Fred Ehrlichman, assistant director of marketing at the National Historical Mint, explained the markings on the gun to Robert Johnson of the Assassination Information Center. This is the gun that Jack Ruby used to play Lee Harvey Oswald on November 24th, 1963. And this is the police tag, the ID tag. You see that in there? There are a lot of interesting markings on the gun. It's from the ballistics tab. MJ is Marvin Johnson, and LM is L. Montgomery. 1230-63 is the date that the test was conducted by those two officers. What's that little chip on the end of the... The handle was checked. We're not exactly sure when or how. We believe that when uh, Ruby was wrestled down to the ground, that it happened at that time, but we haven't been able to absolutely verify that. And interesting, at that time, L.C. Graves, who you know, this guy up here in the black hat, is the man who grabbed the gun and uh, made the arrest. Here's an interest if you look on the back in here. You see LCG 112463. Back on this side, L79237. That's the district attorney file number. What's the significance of the tag? Well, on the tag, you can see, you know, the date of the arrest. Captain hey, Fritz and L.C. Gray, you want to ride to the and it's going to describe 38 Special ah. Colt Cobra, serial number 2744 LW. Is that the original tag? That's the tag, yes sir. Uh, if you look up here on, on the chamber to the arrow, that's where the, uh, it was marked by the police, the chamber that actually fired the round. There are also a series of markings Underneath the uh, trigger guard, Captain Fritz has got his initials. It's hard to see in this particular display. Are these guns still being manufactured? No, I don't believe so. In fact, the bullet that uh, the bullets are no longer manufactured were uh, by Remington, and they're no longer made. The center also participated in the assassination symposium held in Dallas in October. Larry Howard, founder and director of the JFK Assassination Information Center, made the arrangements for the symposium finale. Guests were given a tour of Dealey Plaza, where they met several of the witnesses who had been in the plaza during the assassination. Each witness gave their account of what they had seen that day. Robert Johnson of the center attended the event. Uh, we came down to guide some of the people around Dealey Plaza to introduce them to some of the witnesses who were actually in Dealey Plaza during that period of time, uh, have them ask questions to the people, uh, get their responses, uh, and show them some of the main sites dealing uh, with that terrible day in November uh, 22, 1963. It'll also give them a feel of actually being around the atmosphere, what it was like, and uh, maybe we can find out something from this experience. It is a finale of the symposium, and what a way to wrap it up, you know, give people a chance to be where it happened, take pictures, talk, sort of wander around, feel of it. The JFK Assassination Information Center also offers a bus tour covering the events of November 22, 1963. The bus departs from the West End Marketplace with monitors showing footage from the day of the assassination. The tour makes its way to Harwood Street, where President Kennedy had entered downtown Dallas in 1963. The bus follows the route of the motorcade on Harwood to Maine and toward Dealey Plaza. 
Once the tour arrives in the plaza, guests relive those few moments which changed the course of history. It is 12.10 p.m. on Friday, November 22nd. Lee Bowers is working in the railroad tower located in the parking lot behind the picket fence. He looks out the window and notices a blue and white Oldsmobile without state license plates. Watches as the car slowly circles in front of the tower and leaves the parking lot area. Carolyn Arnold notices Lee Harvey Oswald alone in the second floor lunchroom of the Texas School Book Depository. The time is 12.15. Bonnie Ray Williams, a book depository employee, leaves his partly eaten lunch on the sixth floor and joins co-workers on the fifth floor. Outside on the sidewalk near Elm and Houston Streets, an ambulance arrives to pick up an epileptic who has had a seizure. Is it truly a seizure or a planned diversion to allow assassins to move into the book depository building? Okay, I was working for O'Neill Funeral Home on the day this president was assassinated. Uh, we were up on Harwood Street uh, waiting for the motorcade to go by when we got the call on an epileptic seizure at Elm and Houston across from the county jail, which is this building right directly behind you. And uh, we proceeded on up Elm Street here, we turned on Elm on to Houston, and there was already a police officer here, and the guy was laying on the ground. He had a small skin spot on his head, there was no epilepsy, no seizure whatsoever. We, we couldn't, couldn't tell, but due to the fact he had a head injury, <coughs> we went on ahead and loaded him in the ambulance and took him out to Parkland Hospital. A high school student, Arnold Rowland, is on the east side of Houston Street near Maine. He glances toward the depository and sees two men on the sixth floor. One man has a rifle and is at the west end of the building. The other, a dark-complected man, is at the east end. Lee Bowers glances out the window of the railroad tower at 12.20. He watches as a black 1957 Ford with Texas plates enters the parking lot. The driver appears to be talking into a microphone. Abraham Zapruder positions himself on a concrete pedestal from where he will be able to film the motorcade as it passes. Okay, hi, I'm Marilyn Sitzman. At the time of the assassination, I was Mr. Zapruder's secretary. We were standing here. He was filming the motorcade. I was standing behind him, holding on to him for the end there. Somewhere in the motorcade, a motorcycle officer's microphone sticks open. Only calls from units much closer to the dispatcher can get through on channel one of two channels being used. Lee Bowers notices a third car entering the parking lot area. A muddy white Chevrolet Impala with license plates similar to the first car circles the area slowly and starts back toward the school book depository. He loses sight of the car. The motorcade is running behind schedule due to the large crowds and the fact that President Kennedy has stopped the motorcade twice to shake hands with onlookers. Seconds before 12.30, the motorcade enters through the plaza. The long blue Lincoln passes several deputies who are standing on the sidewalk in front of the sheriff's office. They've been ordered not to take part in security for the president. The clock on top of the depository reads 12.30. President Kennedy's limousine slows to seven miles per hour to make the sharp turn from Houston onto Elm Street. Abraham Zapruder begins filming the motorcade. The first shot is fired from the school book depository. The gun misfires and the bullet strikes the president in the back. Most witnesses believe this shot is a firecracker or a backfire. The sixth floor assassin reloads and fires a second shot. This shot hits a tree branch between the assassin and the president. It ricochets across the plaza, striking the curb on the south side of Elm Street. Bystander James Tague is cut on the face by a flying piece of concrete. On the north side of Elm Street, the only person in the plaza with an open umbrella pumps the umbrella into the air. A third shot is fired from in front of the motorcade and hits John Kennedy in the throat. A dark-complected man standing a few feet from the man with the umbrella raises his fist in the air. A shooter on top of the records building fires into the limousine. The bullet strikes Governor Connolly in the back and exits through his chest. Secret Service agent John Reddy jumps off of the follow-up car and starts toward the presidential limousine. Emery Roberts, special agent in charge of the follow-up car, doesn't believe Reddy can make it to the limousine and calls him back. 
limousine driver William Greer sees people on the overpass and believes he is driving directly into the ambush. He slows the car down, causing the follow-up car to nearly collide with the limousine. A fifth shot is fired. This shot is from the depository building and misses the motorcade entirely, striking the grass on the south side of Elm Street. The gunman behind the picket fence takes aim for the sixth and final shot. Gene Hill sees the flash of the muzzle. Watching as the shot hits President Kennedy in the head. As the car came down, the last shot hit him almost directly in front of us. There was a loud noise, like a gunshot, and about that time the whole the president goes back up against the street like this, and the whole back of his head flies out the back of the limit. It looked like somebody took a bucket of blood and just threw it out the back of his head. Uh, the last shot hitting us right in front of him, I thought the side of Kennedy's head opened up and gray matter come out. Motorcycle officer Bobby Hargis riding to the left and rear of President Kennedy's car is splattered with blood and brains with such force that he believes he has been shot. Jackie Kennedy climbs onto the rear of the limousine to retrieve a part of the president's skull as Secret Service agent Clint Hill races toward the car. He climbs onto the trunk just as the limousine accelerates toward the triple underpass. Deaf-mute Ed Hoffman sees the gunman behind the fence run toward the railroad bridge and toss the rifle to another man who disassembles the gun, puts it into a brown bag, and walks off through the parking lot. J.C. Price, watching from the top of the Terminal Annex building, notices a man behind the picket fence running toward a group of parked cars. Police officer Joe Smith runs into the parking lot area and encounters a man who shows him Secret Service credentials. Except for the agents in the motorcade, there are no Secret Service personnel in Dealey Plaza. Several of the railroad workers run around behind the fence and find muddy footprints and cigarette butts where they had seen a puff of smoke coming from. Gene Hill watches as a man fitting the description of Jack Ruby runs from near the front of the depository toward the parking lot. Many of the witnesses rush up the steps leading from Elm Street to the parking lot. The man with the umbrella sits down on the curb on Elm and watches the crowd. The umbrella is now closed. The dark-complected man walks over and sits down beside him. Many of the witnesses here will later recall that time stood still. As the echoes of the final shot reverberated through Dealey Plaza, the motorcade raced through the triple underpass onto Stemmons Freeway and toward Parkland Hospital. Dr. Robert Shaw remembers the scene as the motorcade reached Parkland. I was at a meeting that was held about 11 o'clock at a nearby hospital, and the meeting was over, and I stopped at a children's hospital, which was close by, to see a child that I had operated on a couple, three days before. Then got out and uh, got in my car, intending to go to uh, first to my office and then uh, to have lunch. As I drove along, I came to the place where the road intersected the industrial boulevard. And there some police were standing and uh, they stopped the traffic and allowed one car to go through. Now, this car was a large limousine. It had a driver, but I couldn't see anybody else in the car. And so it was stopped, and they let this car go through. And by that time, we were in sight of Parkland Hospital. I followed on and uh, parked my car to go into the office building, which is adjacent to Parkland Hospital. Uh, two students joined two other students. They had just come over from Parkland Hospital, and they said, the president has been in, brought in dead on arrival at the emergency room. And these fellows said, you're kidding. No, no, we're not. And says, Governor Conley has been shot in the chest. Well, that was my signal since I was head of thoracic surgery at the medical school to turn around and go back 
uh, to the emergency room. So I arrived there perhaps five to ten minutes after the limousines had arrived there because I saw the limousine go and I followed the limousine. So it was a very short time limit. At the emergency entrance to Parkland, Governor Connolly made an effort to get out of the limousine but slumped back into the car. He was picked up and placed on a stretcher and wheeled into the hospital, down the long corridor, and into trauma room two. Outside, Clint Hill had removed his coat and covered President Kennedy's head. Three more agents placed the president on a stretcher. He was then taken inside and taken to trauma room one. While 12 doctors worked frantically to save the life of President Kennedy, Dr. Robert Shaw was one of the team of doctors who worked on Texas Governor John Connolly. I went in uh, to the emergency room, and on my right was the emergency room to, whom, to which they had brought the president. Now, all I saw of the president was the soles of his shoes because the room was crowded. And uh, I saw Mrs. Uh, Kennedy standing in her beautiful dress with blood all down the dress, uh, standing in the doorway. I turned to my left and across the room across from the one where Kennedy was, and this is where Governor Conley had been brought. Mrs. Conley was standing in the doorway, but I didn't speak to her at that particular time, but went on into the room. The men there had uh, already examined him. He was I would say semi-conscious. He was moaning, but he didn't really uh, know exactly what was going on. They had uh, immediately noticed that he had a gaping wound under his right nipple, uh, which was what we would call a sucking wound, in that it was large enough so that when he breathed, the air went back and forth into his chest. This, of course, made it extremely difficult for him to breathe and to have a large sucking wound, and it was at least five centimeters in diameter. For a long period of time, uh, he would have died. Uh, he was turned onto his left side, and then it was noticed that there was a entrance wound uh, just lateral, you might say, to the... Uh, scapula, and it was the wound through which the bullet had entered, had stripped out a section of about six centimeters of his six ribs. He had, was in the position of turning. At first, when he heard the first bullet which struck the president, he had turned to his right. Then he realized that he wasn't going to be able to see the president from this position, so then he was in the act of turning to the left, like this. Oh, when uh, this bullet struck his chest, came on through his chest, shattered his right wrist, and a, poor, a little fragment of bullet nicked the inner aspect of his uh, lower left thigh. That, that bullet, a shattered bullet, went to the bottom of the limousine. Governor Connolly would recover from his wounds, but John Fitzgerald Kennedy was declared dead at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Aubrey Reich recalls what happened after the president's body was placed in the casket at Parkland. And we started to leave the emergency room with him. We got him outside the emergency room, and the people from the state or the county decided that they was going to do an autopsy on him. And the Secret Service and the government people decided that we was, they was going to take the body on out. So it was quite a struggle over the casket on trying to get it out of the emergency room. We had a long corridor to go through to get to the ambulance dock on the, to load him in there. And there was a lot of pushing and shoving and grabbing the casket. And several times they, they pulled the casket completely off the truck that we was rolling him on. And we had to pick it up and rearrange it back on there to balance it on the, on the truck. Uh, Miss Kennedy was walking behind the casket, had her hand on it uh, at the foot section. We was taking him out head first, and there was a crucifix placed on the casket, metal crucifix, 
and uh, had a magnet on the back to keep it on there. And uh, it was so much pulling and shoving on the casket that I had to hold the crucifix on there to keep it from sliding off. Finally, the casket was removed from Parkland and driven to Love Field to be flown back to Washington on Air Force One. Before the plane left Love Field with the body of the president, the Dallas police were holding the man they would later charge in the assassination. Lee Harvey Oswald had been inside the Texas School Book Depository during the shooting, but was he in the southeast corner window on the sixth floor? According to the Warren Commission, Oswald had gone to the sixth floor, assembled his rifle, and stacked 32 cartons of books weighing 50 pounds each into a barrier standing five and one-half feet high, all without being heard by the employees, only one floor beneath him. The same employees who would hear the bolt action of the rifle and the shells hitting the floor with the sound of gunshots, reverberations, and motorcycle engines on the street only 50 feet below them. According to the commission, this lone assassin then watched as the presidential limousine came directly toward him and passed within 60 feet of him without firing a shot. Instead, he waited until the limousine had turned onto Elm Street and was headed away from him. Then, using a scope adjusted for a left-handed shooter and was so misaligned that two metal shims had to be placed under it before it could be test-fired by an army laboratory, this right-handed assassin squeezed off three shots at the President of the United States. Of these three shots, one was the infamous magic bullet. According to the commission, this bullet struck John Kennedy in the back, turned upward, exited his throat, turned back downward, and to the right, turned left, entered Governor Connolly's back below the right shoulder blade, exited his chest, entered the back of his wrist, exited the front, turned left, and finally lodged in his left thigh, falling out at Parkland Hospital virtually undamaged. With two nearly perfect shots, the Warren Commission concluded that this same assassin, using the same rifle, fired a shot which missed the motorcade entirely, traveling approximately 20 feet above and 20 to 25 feet to the right of the path of the presidential limousine. Following the final shot, Lee Oswald supposedly wiped the rifle clean of any fingerprints, moved quickly across the sixth floor of the depository, hid the rifle where searchers would be sure to find it, and raced down four flights of stairs to the second floor lunchroom, where Officer Marion Baker would encounter him within 90 seconds of the final shot. A major problem with the commission's version is that immediately following the assassination, Sandra Stiles and Victoria Adams left the fourth floor of the depository using the same stairs that Oswald was supposedly running down. Neither woman saw Oswald or heard footsteps on the stairs. Lee could not have used the elevator. It was locked on the fifth floor, making the stairs the only route from the sixth floor to the second. Larry Ray Harris of the JFK Assassination Information Center tells of Oswald's movements following his encounter with Officer Baker. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald told the Dallas police that at the time of the assassination, he was eating lunch in the second floor lunchroom of the school book depository. And indeed, just 90 seconds after the last shot, Oswald was encountered in that second floor lunchroom by a Dallas policeman named Marion Baker and the building superintendent, Roy Cooley. Uh, Oswald was very calm. He was not out of breath, very cool and collected, nothing suspicious about his activity. He was identified as an employee of the building, and uh, they let him go. According to the Warren Commission, at 12.33 p.m., Oswald exited the school book depository's front entrance and walked seven blocks east down Elm Street. He boarded a Dallas City bus, which was carrying him back toward the Texas School Book Depository. And when that bus became stuck in the traffic backed up from the Dealey Plaza assassination site, Oswald left the bus. Curiously, just moments later after he left the bus, the bus was boarded by members of the Dallas Police Department and searched. Oswald then walked two blocks over to the bus station and caught a taxi cab to his rooming house in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. Reaching Oak Cliff, Oswald rode six blocks past his rooming house to the corner of Neely and Beckley. From here, he walked the six blocks back to the rooming house. Cecil Reed was working in Oak Cliff on November 22, 1963. Larry Howard interviewed Mr. Reed near where he was working that day. I'm Larry Howard, director of the JFK Assassination Information Center here in Dallas, Texas. With me today, I have Cecil Reed, 
who was at this spot November 22, 1963. First of all, Cecil, let me ask you, has anybody else ever talked to you about this case? No. The Warren Commission, the House Select Committee? No. no one. Would you tell us what you saw that day? Well, I was standing uh, beside an auto transport right here on this lot, and a yellow cab came down Beckley this direction and pulled up here right at this driveway. And this guy got out and walked up back up the street on this side of the street. According to the Warren report, he entered his rooming house at about 1 p.m. and stayed in his room for several minutes. This was based on the testimony of the housekeeper there at the, his rooming house. According to the Warren report, Oswald left his room at 1.04 p.m. And also according to the Warren report, a Dallas policeman named J.D. Tippett was shot and killed at 1.16 p.m., one mile away from the rooming house. Now, according to Oswald's landlady, however, she looked out the window several minutes later, that is, several minutes after 1.04 p.m., and observed Oswald standing at the curb near the rooming house. Now, while Oswald was in his room, one of the most mysterious episodes of that day occurred. A Dallas police squad car with two occupants pulled up directly in front of the rooming house. The horn beeped twice and the car drove slowly away. The car was never identified and this strange and disturbing episode has, has never been explained. Now, from 1.04, the time Oswald left his rooming house, to 1.16 p.m., the time the commission said the policeman was shot, is 12 minutes. And the scene of the crime is one mile away. Now, we've already seen that several minutes elapsed and Oswald was still standing there at the curb in front of his house. Conversely, it's also clear that several minutes elapsed between the time the officer was shot and the time the police were actually notified over the radio in the officer's car at 1.16 p.m. So that window that Oswald had to walk the one mile is narrowed significantly and it raises the very real possibility that Oswald could not possibly have walked one mile from his rooming house to where the policeman was killed a mile away. Cecil Reed recalls seeing Lee Oswald again that afternoon. And uh, then a few minutes later, he came back down the other side of the street, going that way, toward the Jefferson. Now, I don't know which way he went after he got here, but the last time I saw him, he was right along here. So there's no question in your mind it was the same man that got out of the cab that came back on the yeah, other side. Same guy. Was he walking uh, fast or slow? Or well, he wasn't walking back? real slow, but he was walking a pretty good pace. Right. Normal. Yeah. What, do you recognize what he had on at the time? Well, he had on a, kind of a gray looking slacks, best I can remember. And then he had a, a kind of a checkered uh, jacket. He was carrying the jacket on his arm. What actually happened then is a very much ambiguous. We don't know exactly what happened. There is controversy over whether he actually shot Officer Tippett or uh, how many people were there when Officer Tippett was shot. There are witnesses uh, such as Aquila Clemens who indicated there were two men there. One was short and stocky, the other tall and wiry, and neither seemed to fit the description of Oswald. According to the Warren Commission, after shooting J.D. Tippett, Oswald fled down Jefferson in the direction of the Texas Theater. Just before reaching the theater, he ducked into this doorway as police cars drove by. In 1963, this was a shoe store, and Johnny Brewer was the manager. He noticed Oswald slip into the doorway. And uh, John Brewer, the, uh, the clerk on duty, saw this, and... Uh, I thought he was acting rather strangely, so at this point uh, he sort of looked at him, and after the car, the police car passed by, Oswald continued on down the street in the direction of the Texas Theater. An unidentified man in the theater pointed Oswald out to the police, who arrested Oswald at 1.50 p.m., less than an hour and a half after the assassination of President Kennedy. Lee Harvey Oswald was taken back into downtown Dallas to the police station. It was here that Jack Ruby would murder Oswald in front of millions of television viewers the following Sunday morning. At approximately 2.30 in the morning on Sunday, November 24th, a Dallas police officer received a call at the police station communications room. The caller would not identify himself, but accurately described the plans to transfer Oswald to the county jail and warned that if the plans weren't changed, 
Oswald would be killed in the basement of the station. Though the officer could not place the voice at the time of the call, he knew that it was familiar. Only after the murder of Oswald would the officer realize that the caller had been Jack Ruby. A similar call was made to the local office of the FBI early that Sunday morning. Despite these threats, only minor changes were made in the plans to transfer Lee Oswald. At 11.17 that morning, Jack Ruby sent $25 to Karen Carlin in Fort Worth from the Western Union office in Dallas. From here, he walked the short distance to the police station. Although the Warren Commission concluded that Ruby entered the basement through this tunnel, many researchers believe he entered through this side entrance and was led to the basement. Regardless of which entrance Ruby used to gain access to the basement, he was now in position and Oswald could be brought down. Exiting the elevator, Oswald was led down this short hallway. As he came into full view of the television cameras, Jack Ruby stepped from the shadows and fired one shot, killing Lee Harvey Oswald and making him the third known victim of the assassination. Oswald was pronounced dead at Parkland Hospital at 1.07 p.m., 48 hours and 7 minutes after some of the same doctors had pronounced the death of John F. Kennedy. When Jack Ruby was informed of the death of Lee Oswald, the officer's impression, as recalled later, was that Jack felt that his own life had depended on the death of Oswald. Even as a terrified nation watched the body of its dead president being carried to its resting place, and even as Lee Harvey Oswald was being quietly buried at Rose Hill Cemetery, many of the nation's people were beginning to ask questions, which still go unanswered today. These unanswered questions, along with new information found in declassified files, have led to widespread skepticism concerning the conclusions of the Warren Commission. Serious challenges of the Commission's findings include their conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald was on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository during the shooting. It is known that Oswald was seen on the second floor at the same time or after Arnold Rowland was seeing two men on the sixth floor. One of the men had a rifle at that time. Howard Brennan stated that he saw a gunman firing from the sixth floor window during the assassination, and yet he could not pick Oswald out of a police lineup that evening. It is also known that Lee Oswald was encountered on the second floor by Officer Marion Baker within 90 seconds of the final shot. Two photographs, one taken at approximately 15 seconds after the shooting and one taken between 30 seconds and two minutes after the last shot, show clearly that the boxes in the southeast corner window were rearranged in the time span between the times when the photographs were taken. The commission further concluded that there was no evidence of any shots being fired except from the school book depository. Lee Bowers, however, stated that he saw men in the area behind the picket fence during the assassination. Deaf mute Ed Hoffman stated that he saw a gunman behind the fence take a shot at the president. Jean Hill stated that she saw a muzzle blast from behind the picket fence. Several railroad workers noticed a puff of smoke coming from the fence. When they ran around to the spot where they had seen the smoke, they found cigarette butts and muddy footprints. The Warren Commission concluded that there were only three shots fired. This was based primarily on finding three shells on the sixth floor of the depository. Yet the lip on one of the shells was dented and could not have fired a bullet in the condition in which it was found. Further, the recording made at the police station due to an officer's microphone being stuck open in the motorcade indicated that from four to nine shots may have been fired. Perhaps the most widely rejected conclusion of the Warren Commission is that one bullet went through both President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. 
Like the majority of Americans, Governor Connolly never believed he was hit by the same bullet that hit John Kennedy. Dr. Humes probed John Kennedy's back wound at the autopsy at Bethesda and claimed he could feel the end of the bullet track with his finger. Finally, the majority of medical personnel at Parkland who viewed the throat wound of the president felt that it was an entrance wound. The commission also concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald fired the shots that killed the president, even though the paraffin test administered to Oswald indicated that he had not fired a rifle on the day of the shooting. The Warren Commission found that Lee Oswald had also killed police officer J.D. Tippett. At the scene of the crime, however, Officer Gerald Hill radioed that shells at the scene indicated that an automatic pistol had been used. Oswald was arrested with a revolver. The cartridge cases reportedly taken from the scene do not match up with the bullets recovered from J.D. Tippett's body. Oswald's landlady saw him by a bus stop near the rooming house at approximately 1.04 p.m., and witnesses to the Tippett murder placed the time of the shooting at approximately 1.10 p.m. This time frame would give Oswald approximately six minutes to make it from the rooming house to the scene of the murder. Oswald supposedly talked to Officer Tippett through the window of the police car, but photographs of the scene show that this window was rolled up. At least two witnesses to the murder of J.D. Tippett have reported seeing two men involved in the shooting. Finally, the Warren Commission concluded that Jack Ruby's killing of Lee Harvey Oswald was not part of any conspiracy. However, Jack Ruby implied that it was and asked several times to be removed from Dallas and taken to Washington to testify. Ruby, however, was never removed from Dallas and died without ever revealing his real motive for silencing Oswald. The JFK Assassination Information Center bus tour concludes at the police station where Jack Ruby stepped into the pages of history. As the bus makes its way back toward the West End marketplace, guests ponder the still unanswered questions. In the nearly three decades since the murder of John F. Kennedy, two federal investigations, countless investigations by private individuals and organizations, and hundreds of books, reports, and films have failed to resolve these questions. There are hundreds of opinions as to what took place during those few seconds in Dealey Plaza, but in the end, how many shots were fired and which shot hit who are only of significance in supporting what the majority of Americans already believe that a conspiracy was behind the death of John Kennedy. More important questions include who was behind the assassination? I think that the assassination had, was mainly conspired by the government of the United States and I think that Lyndon Johnson was the head guy, the main person involved. Um, the shadow government that the movie JFK hit it on, um, but not just the CIA, I mean, people bigger than the CIA. I have a feeling it was CIA and Mafia combined uh, together to do this. I think a secret government that includes the CIA, the FBI, probably elements of organized crime, and one which is continuing to act today against the interests of the country for the same reasons that Kennedy was killed back in the early 60s, over economic policies and the directions of the country. In order to prevent assassinations of future presidents, we must understand the forces behind the assassination. And how can we ever get to the truth? I think it's absolutely critical that the files be released, that all the files be brought out, because my biggest concern is that the, there's been a continuity of activity by a secret government. Um, I think now where we need to be moving to is to a special prosecutor or something along those lines where somebody with some legal authority with um, the ability to subpoena people 
who can actually cause something to happen under testimony, under oath, to, to try to bring some of these things together and bring it out into the public light in such a way that we can actually get to the bottom of it and let things fall where they may. On November 22, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the fourth U.S. president to be assassinated. Nearly 30 years later, why do we still care? Well, just like I think, or I used to think, I'm not so sure anymore, I was down here to do what everybody else was, to get a look at the president, the most charismatic man we've ever had in office, and um, someone that I loved and adored very much, had supported to become president. Even though I was not old enough to vote, I drove people to the, uh, to the polls to vote when he was elected. I just got my driver's license. At that point in time, as we were leaving Love Field, emotions were so high and strange that my father forgot where he was driving. We just kind of drove aimlessly, uh, in disbelief, no one really not knowing what to say or what to do. We thought about driving down to Vivi Plaza, Parkland Hospital, but it didn't make sense. Nothing made sense. That day. We went home. We were trying to understand how to deal with it not only as a family, but as individuals. Our parents tried to explain to us as children uh, what the significance of that event was. And all I knew was that I had lost a leader. I had lost a father figure. It was hard to deal with, it still is. We miss him very much.